Over the years, we have mentioned here and elsewhere the plight of the Lord's church in remaining faithful to the truth of the New Testament. And this would be true in every generation, whether it's now or back when the New Testament was being written in the first century or anywhere in between or any time in the future, if there is a future. If the church of Christ, and I'm specifically, specifically thinking of it in America because that's where we are, but it would be true if you were in England or Russia or wherever you might be in the world, but if the church of Christ, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, here in the United States of America, is to survive the storms of change, it will be because hundreds, and I'd like to think thousands of individual Christians, who make up the church, of course, will stand up in opposition to encroaching error. Most of the New Testament's written to Christians to keep them faithful. When you consider Paul's writing to the young preacher Titus in giving the qualifications of elders, which are found in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, Titus would have a part in upholding the truth and keeping the church what the Lord wanted it to be. Now this statement, as I say, is originally made by Paul to Titus for him to know and preach to the churches as applied to elders in their work as shepherding the flock. Verse 9 of chapter 1, Paul writes, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. And then he says, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. And he goes ahead and de delivers more about it, and especially verse 13, concerning them, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Well, that's just one passage of Scripture among those written to Christians as to the grievous and great and sobering responsibility that rests upon elder shoulders in particular because of their work but on every member of the Lord's church to be prepared to defend the faith and to know the difference in truth and error. And please, if you were here this morning, think about what we said about the law that stood in the middle, that the thing is either true or false. There's no in-between. And what is interesting when you study the whole of the Bible, whether it's the patriarchal age, the mosaical system, or the Christian dispensation, which covers still to this day and will to the end of time. In the course of all of that human history and God down through the ages revealing in the scheme of redemption how he would save us through the gospel, have you ever just noticed the individuals who were called upon in being faithful to their God to stand alone and that in standing alone they made the difference now men no doubt at that time took no note of them but we're interested in who God takes note of and who God blesses and who God says ought to be noticed and learned from I want to start back with Cain and Abel Cain was the older brother, Abel the younger. And in most cases, a younger brother looks up to an older brother. Now they both offered sacrifices in worship to God as was characteristic of that age. But we know that God instructed them in how to worship because it is said in verse 4 of Hebrews 11 
By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Since faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17, then we know Abel is acting upon the word of God. And it says, by which, speaking of Abel, he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Well, what does he say to us, being dead all these thousands of years? That even if you're a younger brother and you look up greatly to your older brother, he has no right, no right to lead you away from the truth. And how it must have been for Abel when his brother would have dealt with him as he did and finally even out in the field killed him simply and only because Abel did what God told him that Cain also knew. Abel stood alone. We come down through all the years till the time that man has grown exceedingly sinful in the earth. And when you come down to Genesis chapter 6, God declares to Noah, I'm going to destroy this world. And you found favor, found grace in my sight. And thus he gives to him how he would be saved from the great worldwide flood that was going to destroy everybody off the earth. And so you have Noah, his wife, their three sons, and the sons' wives out of all of the human race who had to stand alone. He said, well, they had one another, but they're alone as far as the rest of the world's concerned. And yet they are the ones that are selected in that great Hall of Fame chapter of faithful service to God that's meant to teach us of what we ought to be. Verse 7 of Hebrews 11, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. All that they did as it took time to build that ark and to continue in the eyes of all the people around about them who, like worldly people normally do, look at folks like that and say, he must be off his limb. <laughs> and yet that didn't stop them from being what they ought to be. Noah stood alone in this terribly corrupt society. And thus, through him, God chose one to preserve a remnant of humanity when God destroyed everything else that had the breath of lives in it. Well, we see the development further of a messianic promise and then the messianic race being formed but before we get to the race we come to a man called Abraham Abram as he is first noticed then he's changed to Abraham he was a person in Ur of the Chaldees and God spoke to him told him to leave all your country and your family but he didn't tell him where to go off over there today, we're in the land between the rivers of the Tigris Euphrates, which is in modern day Iraq, down toward the Persian Gulf where they empty. That's where he was. Certainly the terrain has changed because the alluvial deposits from the rivers have changed. Abraham left, went up around the Fertile Crescent. Finally, he's in Canaan, and he's a lonely pilgrim. But he has God's promises. He does what God says. He takes God at his word. And always acted as God directed him. Because he trusted in the promise God made to him. Genesis 12. And God fulfilled it eventually. But then we come down to the time that. Takes us through. Jacob and his sons. And Joseph in particular. And how that they sold Joseph into slavery out of jealousy and envy. 
lied to their father saying that he was killed by the wild animals, took the coat of many colors and dipped it in the goat's blood, told a lie to their father, but he was sold into slavery down in Egypt. He went down there and remained faithful. He had every opportunity in the world to change as a young man. But he stood true to what he knew was the truth. By himself, he did. And thus, there was raised up a people, and finally there was a time when people, the pharaohs, didn't know Joseph, didn't appreciate him, didn't respect him. And thus, they took the ever-growing Israelites and afraid of them they put them in bondage and in time the cry of those Israelites in bondage to Egypt caused God and we're making a long story a little bit shorter to raise up Moses interesting the providential care of God that Moses would be saved from the decree of Pharaoh who said we'll kill all the Hebrew babies. But his mother took him and put him in the bulrushes in a little boat, an ark. Pharaoh's daughter got him and raised him and the sister saw when she picked him up immediately approached her and said, I know a nurse. And it was his own mother who, from what we learned in the Scriptures, taught him in the ways of his own people and taught him about God. And when he was 40 years old, raised with the best education you could get at that time, a very rich house, he was cast out, we were one of the details, of Egypt, went down to the land of Midian, and there he lived another 40 years, pretty much alone, and only when he's 80 years old does God appear to him to, to lead out the children of Israel from the land of bondage. All by himself, he started out to Egypt. And may I say he had an assignment that would stagger most people. Then once they got through the Red Sea at God's direction, after all those plagues preceding that in Egypt, Alone, he confronted his own brother Aaron and the fickle crowd of sinners when they were at the foot of Mount Sinai and he was on top receiving the law of Moses for the people. And he continued more through the years till everybody in Israel that was 20 years old and up had died except for Joshua and Caleb. And because he sinned himself and sin must be punished by just God, he wasn't allowed to go over in the land of Canaan. But God took him up on Mount Pisgah and allowed him to look over and see the land of Canaan before he turned everything over to Joshua, the son of Nun. And there Moses died on Mount Pisgah. And God buried him. And no man to this day knows where he buried him. But then we come down through the children of Israel in the land of Canaan, Time and time again they were warned, you must do what God tells you. If not, he will take you off this land just like he did the Canaanites. But they didn't listen. Finally, after the northern kingdom had been swept away into captivity by the Assyrians, the southern kingdom didn't learn any better. All sorts of prophets had been sent to them telling them to repent, pointing out their sins. It didn't work. But then the time came when the end of Jerusalem and Judah had come. And there was the great, magnificent prophet called the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. Now, remember, all these people up until now pretty much stood alone. So Jeremiah kept a lonely vigil in Judea when most of his people were tossed to and fro in great and mass confusion. They wouldn't listen to him and they treated him terribly. He was hated and he was persecuted for his loyalty to God, but he alone remained faithful. 
At that same time, there was another prophet who had gone on earlier in uh, one of the earlier invasions because there were three into Judah before the last one. And he had gone on into Babylon in captivity then. His name was Ezekiel. And he was all by himself. He was all alone in Tel Aviv in Babylon. It's always interesting to me when I read the call of Ezekiel. God called him and said, you'll only tell those people what I put in your mouth to say and nothing else. And when you get through telling them, they're not going to do it. But you say only what I tell you to say. And then after he goes through that, giving great emphasis to those things, he says, I'm going to make your forehead as flint against their rejection to the truth you preach them. So you'll be able to stand it. And he had to face then these terribly stubborn, terribly hard-headed Hebrews with a message that was true, but they did not want to hear it. You're here. You're here for your own faults. You made bad decisions. You wouldn't listen. You wouldn't repent when you had the chance to. So you're here, and you're going to be here 70 years. You might as well build your houses and sit down because you're here for a while. And that's what he did. Then we come down through the years, and we come to the time of Christ. And the forerunner of the Christ faced the same thing. Think how alone John the baptizer was as he preached, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he pointed out to the Christ, to the people, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And he wasn't somebody that was cowardly, for he stood up against the king in an unlawful marriage and says, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And a wicked woman through her as wicked daughter got the fickle and weak king to cause him to lose his head. But he stood alone. Noah, before him, Abel, Abraham, Moses, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, John the baptizer. We could add others. They stood alone as far as human beings are concerned. But then Jesus came. The word that became flesh, the one the Old Testament prophets had spoken of. Jesus faced the Pharisees and he didn't back up. And his own disciples didn't really understand a lot of the stuff he was teaching. And even many of them at one point went back and walked no more with him. But he kept on. He had a work to do. Nobody else could do it. He knew that the whole world's salvation was in his hands. He continued on to the end and he faced the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin. He faced Pilate. He tried every way a politician would to get out from having to kill Jesus. He saw quickly and told the Jews so. This man's done nothing worthy of death, but they wouldn't have it. The more he tried to release him, the more the howling mob cried out, crucify him. Who were these people? They were people who 1,500 years had the law of Moses, which was a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ, and now they have him, and they cry, crucify him. He alone did God's will. And all of that in order to save humanity in order to establish his church. But then we come down, the church is established, Acts chapter 2. We read of people receiving the truth, believing it, repenting of their sins, being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. The Lord added them to that church that he purchased with his blood, Acts 20 verse 28. And then you look at all of the apostles that are recorded in the book of Acts and see what they underwent. But then I think, of course, of the man chosen to be the apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle Paul. How often did he have to stand alone? He even told Philippians, at my first offense, no man stood with me. He stood alone, but he stood 
He stood alone before the powers of Judaism and before imperial Rome. He never wavered in his testimony or in the preaching of the gospel and even corrected others, even an apostle who had gone astray. When we come down past inspiration, to the time to where the Roman Catholic Church had fully formed and for hundreds of years had total sway and control in Europe. There were men who were not New Testament Christians, men like Wycliffe, Tyndall, and Huss, and Luther, and Knox, who put themselves through all manner of persecution, some even dying and being burned at the stake, just to give us the Bible in our own tongue. What a challenge it was for them. All of that then comes down to finally, here is a nation on this earth called the United States of America that has in its constitution those things that protect us thus far the freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and so on. We need to be reminded, even as those in the first part of the 19th century who made the call to return to ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity to oppose denominationalism and man's teaching and point out that the only way to have the unity that is commanded in 1 Corinthians 1.10 and prayed for by our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane is to be sure we have the right standard. The Bible and the Bible only makes Christians only and the only Christians when it's properly divided and applied. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. When you preach that word, men who understand it and honestly come to it in obedience don't become some hyphenated Christian. They just become Christians when they obey the gospel. And we need to be very thankful, even for these men who were not Christians, like Wycliffe, Tyndall, Huss, Luther, and Knox, and others, because they did work to get us English Bible. So we can study it in our own tongue. Now the question I must raise is, Look what all it took to get that here. Do we take it for granted? This is a very bloody book, this Bible. Blood's all over it. Blood that saved us, that flowed from Christ. Before that, that which typified his blood, all the many goats and bulls and lambs and pigeons and doves that shed their blood all that, and then the people that died just to give us an English translation. We come down today, what will be of the Lord's church from here on out? That depends on us. It doesn't depend on you. It does depend on you. Now watch what I'm saying. It depends on each one of us recognizing our responsibilities as individual Christians. That we'll take this Bible, we'll live by it, let come what may. So in every generation, there are going to be situations where the faithful child of God must face the choice. Either to stand alone or to have himself or herself swept alone by a worldly crowd. Well, I can tell you what most will do, and I'm sad to say it. Most, the majority, it's never been in the right. It'll be swept along to do those things that are convenient, that are easy. A gospel that says there's no cross to bear is not easy. And if you'll think about what we said this morning, that there is no middle ground between truth and error, then all these people out here says there is no God, I must stand up and say, oh, that's just as wrong as it can be. God exists, and I can teach you about him. 
and somebody else in our secular society <clears throat> and pluralistic society saying, well, look, we've got Muslims and we've got Buddhists and we've got this, that, and the other when it comes to different religions and we've got all the denominations and they're all sincere of heart. And there's good people all out there. No. There's two kinds of people in this world spiritually. Children of the devil and children of God. That's all. Children of the devil and children of God. And no one is a child of God who doesn't hear, believe, and obey from the heart the gospel of Jesus Christ, repenting of sins, confessing their faith in Christ, and being buried with the Lord in baptism, baptism in water, to obtain the remission of sins. We've sinned against God. Sin is a transgression of the law. And thus it is God who forgives us when from the heart we obey that form of doctrine, Romans 6, 17, and 18, and verses 3 and 4 in the same chapter. God has always had a faithful theme, and it's found only in the Bible, Romans 9, 27. All men recognize the strength and the merit of the individual who stands and fights for what he or she believes. And one can make a great difference or else Cain and Noah and Abraham, Moses and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Jesus and Paul. There are just so many names in a long ago history. God in one makes a majority. And it doesn't make me any difference if there are multiplied millions on the other side of the fence from the truth, <clears throat> embracing error. One person with the truth, living as it teaches, makes all the difference in the world. There are men of conviction whose very face will light up an error. Andrew Jackson, I'm not saying that his character was what it ought to be, but he was known as a very courageous man and one who took his stand. Said one man with courage makes a majority. But when that courage is called on, it's not going to be easy to stand up. It gets you in a pinch, you still got to be right. And there are a lot of places in this world today when someone wants to become a Christian and it comes to the point of standing up publicly and saying, I believe with my heart, all my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're in big trouble right away. Where are we today? The church is not where it was a few years ago. The church is made up of people. Why is that? Because people are not what they were a few years ago even the people, some of them, who make up the church. Great many people that meant so much to me as a young person and a young man are all dead and gone. And every time they die, and you look at the people replacing them, and while there's some good, sound, solid people, they're fewer and fewer. Because the world and its allurements are out there. When it comes to morality, you see what's happening in the nation, but when it comes to New Testament, pure New Testament Christianity... It's the same way. We have become accustomed all up to my lifetime because of the success of the preaching of the gospel and people obeying it through the 19th century and early part of the 20th century. Of just automatically having a, like, a place like this to come because there's enough people to buy the land, enough people to build our own buildings, enough people to do this, that, and the other, and we just take it for granted right now that's changing well I'm not going to change with it <laughs> and I'm not talking about matters of having a display like this television set over here uh, those things can change in the way of technology I wouldn't say a person sitting because they still are demanding uh, that we must have a typewriter rather than use a computer. Those things 
or an area of experience. The thing I'm trying to say is there's a difference in the truth of what one must believe and do to be saved from your sins by God and of the way you get the message out. So will we bend? The rougher it gets, will we bend? Will we break? So as the stormy winds of change envelop us and continue to envelop us, I know, I know there will be many who will cease to be faithful and they'll surrender their beliefs to go with the flow and they will apostatize. Well, that's where we need to look back to Abel and Noah and Abraham. And that should tell you why they're listed in the New Testament and of all places, Hebrews chapter 11. The great hall of fame of faithful servants of God. Not a one of them are members of the church, but it's written to members of the church to say if they didn't have anywhere near what you have, look how faithful they were to what they had. And that's an amazing thing. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. And it goes on and develops it all the way through. Those folks never knew things that we know and have at our hand. They never held a New Testament in their hand. Never. But what God told them to do, they knew God told them to do it. And they trusted him because he was God no matter what anybody else did. To put it in Shakespeare's words, he's called the Bard of Avon. But screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. But some of us are, we need the screwdriver screwing a little harder so the nut won't come loose. Stand alone, yes, if we must, as far as human beings are concerned. But know this, we're not alone when it comes to God. He is with us when we must, among humans, stand alone. He was with all these people. I didn't even mention David, but countless others. So they are written there to keep us straight according to the teaching of the New Testament and the doctrine of Jesus Christ. So what is our attitude about things like this? Look around about us. Anything goes. Go to many churches right now and they love to do anything and what they're doing they don't want to do it. Doctrine. Well we studied kind of about how people deal with that this morning. So if you're not a Christian, we urge you to become one. The same way you become a Christian today is the way you became a Christian back in the times of the first century. Believing in Christ, that belief formed, strengthened by the Word of God, the evidence that's there, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, and the truth of it teaches you how to become a Christian. Repenting of your sins, which we're commanded to do, Acts 17, 30. Confessing your faith in the Christ and the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. Now you're qualified before God to take the last step into Christ, which is baptism into Christ. By His authority, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to obtain the remission of your sins. The Lord says, I'll add you to the church because your sins are remitted. The blood's been applied that I shed for the remission of sins. And His word is true. The child of God, we need to remember that about every obligation the New Testament places upon us as Christians and not turn to the left hand or to the right, no matter where we're the only ones. Are you prepared to set it home by yourself because there is no church that is faithful anywhere and worship God according to the New Testament pattern? We ought to be. But we won't be by ourselves. Because God will be with us. If you're subject then to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.